Heather, did you hear about the lady in a coma? No. She was actually pregnant, but she came out of coma, and the doctor said, hey, we have great news. You delivered while you were in a coma, and the baby's absolutely healthy. And she said, oh, my goodness, where's my baby? I need to see him. He's like, more great news. You actually had twins. Blessed. And she's like, oh, my goodness, I need to see him. He's like, they're just a room over. Um, I do want to tell you other good news. Your brother actually came and named them for you. Mm. She said, oh, my goodness, he's such an idiot. What did he name them? He said, well, the first one he named Denise. And she's like, oh, that's not so bad. What, what's the other one's name? He said, the nephew. <laughs> okay, Corey, we'll be starting her world comedy tour here soon. But until then, we have her for one last episode. <laughs> it was nice knowing you guys. On the podcast. <laughs> Anyways, this is a sugar cookie marketing co- podcast. But before we get into it, Twin, what was your weekend like? My weekend? Well, this morning, I have six dozen cookie orders, six and a half dozen cookie orders this week. It goes to one person? Six dozen does do. Six dozen does Does do. Go to one person. Really? Maybe really cool if I had like a twin sister to like help me bake. (laughs) Girl can dream. But this morning I wake up at five o'clock to like pep talk the airbrush machine. Oh, it's airbrushing. Your forte. My (laughs) forte. Uh, So it went horribly wrong. Glad to tell you. I will be redoing those things. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So this is the Sugar Cookie Marketing Podcast. What can somebody who happened upon this podcast expect in the next line? We're going to say it's 30 minutes. It's probably going to be an hour. <laughs> well, you can expect. What we wanted to, and what I often do when I am decorating cookies, is I actually listen to podcasts. So I thought, Heather, let's have a podcast. So folks we can that- annoy them in more than one way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't tell them my secret. No, but sometimes you can't always scroll. A lot of times with the Facebook algorithms, you miss the good posts, um, the learning posts. So I said, let's do a podcast that kind of reiterates things from the group, um, topics that we want to talk about. And hence, Baking It Down with Sugar Cookie Marketing was born. Mm. And there was one named Denise and one was named Denise. <laughs> <laughs> so a quick breakdown of what the podcast entails is the intro where Corey does her stand-up routine and you guys, if you like it or not, marketing minute, something a little bit more marketing focused, business of baking, something a little bit more business focused. You see what we did there with the mm-hmm. name? Uh, course coverage uh, where we talk, you know, we do not have the course up yet. Uh, Corey and I really like to plan. We hate to execute. <laughs> <laughs> we have been filming endlessly, screen sharing endlessly. So we're just going to cover a parts of the course that we think should be Highlighted. Highlighted. This is a paid course that's not out yet, so you can't buy it. That's a, that's a crazy <laughs> thing. Uh, we just like talking about it. <laughs> we go through voicemails and text, follow up with group stuff, which we've got a lot of exciting lives coming up. Twinterest, mine will be boring this week. I'm so sorry. Uh, sponsors and the mailbag. Cannot wait. If Heather sounds a little down sultry. and out to you, mm. sultry. She had actually uh, the Delta variant. <laughs> no, <laughs> just had, kidding. Had a head cold <laughs> this week. So she is just coming Maybe out of the voice sounds better. Maybe my voice sounds better. They always say you're the high squeaky one. So mm. I don't know. <laughs> All right, Heather. Heather is actually going to take on the marketing minutes. Yeah. So you guys can have my head know, cold. Congest- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure people are, like, moving their radios away from their baby stations. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, marketing minutes. I oh, just wanted to touch on something that we've been focused on in the group this last month, and it's a valuable marketing lesson regardless for everybody, and it's the diversification of marketing. Could you have given it a lot To dumb cool it name. down, <laughs> eggs in a basket. <laughs> okay. So oftentimes, you know, we always say, like, hey, just get out there, do something. But if you're being strategic here, Putting all your marketing eggs in one basket is very dangerous, especially when you don't own the basket. Boom, boom, boom. And that basket I'm referring to is Facebook. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you know, Facebook uh, five years ago was basically a wild, much different environment. West. It really was. I mean, you could run a Facebook ads like campaign and I could get 10,000 likes in 24 hours. And you also had an insatiable reach. Anything you farted on there, someone was going to see it. Because I don't know that the algorithm even truly existed. I think it was this kind of like, this hey, get them thing. to like the page and then they'll see everything. Yeah. Give them a little taste. A lot taste. more chronological. Take take it from them. <laughs> right. So then now as Facebook's morphed and the algorithms become more complex and then Facebook's added more aspects of itself, groups are kind of new. Shops you can buy. Shops are brand new. Yeah. You know, you have, now you have the Instagram component that's slowly, they're becoming kind of more of a right. singular platform um, we see the need for a diversification of marketing because today if the facebook group shut down twenty thousand people you'd no longer be able to reach how would you reach them and if you don't know the exact answer to that question this is something that you could possibly pay a little of attention to because it it's 
It could happen. It, it could happen. I see now that Facebook's upticking with violations and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, someone posted in the group that she had violated something on Facebook. She didn't quite say what it was. She just said that m- Facebook had misread the word or whatever, like mistook the comment for something mm-hmm. else. But now when you go to like her page, a pop-up comes and says, this: the admin of this page has been known to share false content, fake news, something like mm-hmm. that. Would you like to continue to the page? So almost you have a prompt. That kind of sounds scary to mm-hmm. like dissuade you from going there. Um, yeah, I said that you should burn down your house if there's a spider in it. And they said I incited violence, yeah. and she which was, I did. <laughs> Kill the spiders. <laughs> Muted for 24 hours. She couldn't even react to a comment. Because the API is accessed through my personal account to publish to our clients' yeah. pages, it actually did not allow even a, my scheduled post to go out for them. Nor mine, I saw. Sorry. Well, get your own API. <laughs> get off my API. So when we talk about diversification of marketing, we're just summarizing. Put your eggs in multiple baskets. So Heather, with multiple baskets. Multiple baskets. So I'm going to kind of break down examples, kind of what we use even for our client strategies or what we use for sugar cookie marketing and something that most people here could absolutely use as well. Online marketing is that. Uh, it's pretty universal. You know, you can pick and choose some things. But if you at least had accounts and you were slowly growing them, we would be considered a diversified marketing strategy. So for social media, Facebook page, Facebook group, they operate differently. I do encourage both of you can figure out how to manage them. Mm -hmm. Um, The Facebook group that we have reaches many more people than our page does. However, we can only run ads to the page, so oh, not to the group. There. So there's a little bit of a twofer there. Okay. Um, an Instagram account, even though Facebook and Instagram are getting closer and closer to a big old bear hug, it is a different platform where it does allow multiple accounts. So if you lose one, maybe you wouldn't lose the other. And you can get a lot more reach on Instagram. Yeah. So Instagram has, you know, with Facebook's new page experience rolling out, I'm curious how some stuff will change. And I think it will be to our benefit. Okay. Um, I also think it's going to be a lot more paid stuff <sighs> always is right and then a tiktok account it's completely unrelated to facebook and its ecosystem and if you lost your facebook page you could potentially lose an instagram account if they're associated yes but your tiktok account would go untouched mm-hmm. and vice versa um another example of diversification of marketing for sugar cookie marketing is this podcast oh mm-hmm. yeah so it doesn't matter what happens on social media on facebook the podcast has its own demographic reach and you subscribe through apple Podcasts or spotify so when uh you know, episode goes up, we're reaching a certain demographic. True. And you can tell people to burn the spiders down. Burn the spiders. Watch, watch Spotify <laughs> be like, excuse me. <laughs> it's not more about Come again? <laughs> uh, another diversification of marketing is paid ads. Um, an example of paid ads are Facebook and Instagram ads. Mm-hmm. You know, TikTok has its own ads that you can start targeting people in. I see. I'd love to skip them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right, Bob. <laughs> um, and then uh, Google Pay Per Click, which is now called Google Ads. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a way to reach people through search. And then there's Google AdSense and things like that. So there's just an ecosystem of paid ads where literally you can shell out money and reach the top of your demographic. Can I add just one? Because I know that people should hear about that. Go but ahead. next door ads. I know, next door sponsorships. Yeah. Um, the way next door sponsorships work is you can pay to sponsor a. Tell them uh, what next door is. If you first. haven't heard of next door, it is a community based uh, social networking platform where you're only allowed to join your zip code. I know. It's not a relationship thing. It is a zip code based thing. They even send you a postcard for verification. Yeah. Uh, you log in, you can verify it. It does have a lot of cool features like you know, announcing if you're going to be open for Halloween trick-or-treaters or if you're going to say, you know, come pick candy or like don't stop by at all right. and things like that. And they can do community announcements. So Nextdoor has realized that there's an untapped market with businesses Mm -hmm. and has opened up the ability to create a business account. So I know a lot of people have a bad taste in their mouth with Nextdoor. If they have any experience with it, it's a place to complain about your neighborhood, (laughs) for sure. (laughs) Just like that. Um, But with Nextdoor business, you're no longer held to the rules where people typically delete your post. I know. Because it is admin-based as well. Yeah. Um, So create your business account, and for free, within two miles of your location, you can create a sales post. Nobody can delete them as long as they follow the, you know, terms of service. Um, But you can also sponsor zip code, which means you can reach people outside of your neighborhood. um, But that are still local. That's what's amazing mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. it. So kind of a great idea. Uh, Here in this more affluent area, we're looking at like $200 a zip code. And that's $200 Uh, a month. $200 a month. Mm -hmm. You get two posts to reach that zip code. Um, And then for like a less populous neighborhood, you're looking around. I think the lowest they go is $45 a month. Okay. 
So just an option there. Again, a diversified way to reach your target market. Yes. That is, if you lost your Facebook page, you'd still have your next door page. They're not related. Right. Um, if we keep going, email marketing is a huge one. Huge. I think a lot of people sleep on it. Um, you know, Corey and I uh, have started an email marketing list for Sugar Cookie Marketing. We'll send out a recap of the podcast and the group every Tuesday. Uh, what you know, you name I, it? Did I? Two for Tuesday. Oh, two, two Tuesday. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it is a great, great, great. Corey and I just come up with names and that's about it. <laughs> no, I'd abandon the um, ideas. <laughs> email marketing can be as simple as sending through your Gmail. Wouldn't recommend it. There are some protocols that you must follow with an email marketing campaign, and that includes an unsubscribe button at the footer. If your email does not have that, you are at risk of violating a lot of rules and getting your email in timeout, which means no deliverability. And when I say deliverability, it's will my email reach Corey and or will it be pushed into the promotions folder or even spam. worse, spam? Uh, I will say I know like half the people listening just rolled their I eyes know. when Hello. you said Hello. email marketing. Hello. <laughs> but the thing is, it's not about you. If you don't answer emails, that's fine. You're also not going to buy your own cookies. Um it's about your target audience. I can tell you Heather and I live in our inboxes um, if it gives us the opportunity to avoid work. Here's my thing. If uh, if it's if it didn't work, why is every big company doing it? I don't know. No, ma'am. No, because no. I don't check mine, so then it must not work. <laughs> <laughs> we are not our target audience. Um, I do check emails uh, from companies I am try- I like. If uh, I'm awkwardly in line at a store, I will go to my promotions folder and see right. what's lurking. Um, a lot of times I don't even open the email, but I will look at the subject line to see if there's anything there. <gasps> Average okay. click-through rate, which means I opened the email and clicked a button on it, is around 4 to 5%. 4 to 5%, not <laughs> 45%. Say <laughs> so don't send an email and be upset with the open rates. Uh, don't be upset with the unsubscribe rate. Um, again, that's... Trimming the fat yeah, of your yeah. target audience. Your target audience says, I will not be in your target audience anymore. And you say, thank you, because that will keep you on a lower tier. So, you know, we've used MailChimp in the past. It's not my favorite, but it is free under 2,000 uh, contacts. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of power there. Um, I think we'll be switching to Send a Grid. Um, it's just a little bit better for drip campaigns. And when I say a drip campaign, if I send you an email on Monday and okay. I send you another email on Wednesday, that would be automated. <gasps> uh, that would How be a drip rude. campaign. Depending on your actions in the email, I can set up a workflow for your, hey, Corey, doesn't look like you opened this. Hey, hey, Corey, open it. <laughs> um, and things like that. Uh, websites. Yes. And you control your favorite. domain and your hosting. This is the one that probably you own the most of, um, that you have most control over. So owning your own website, owning your own domain name means that even if Facebook closed you down tomorrow, you still wouldn't lose that ability to reach your clients. Um, I see a lot of people who said, hey, I got banned from Facebook and I can no longer message my clients. What do I do? Well, the question, the answer is no, there's no recourse. <laughs> um, if you had their email, you could though. Yes. Um, you could send them an email marketing or you could direct people to your website. Mm-hmm. The best thing about a website, it's a twofer. You do get an egg in a different basket, but you also can rank your website for keywords in Google and get a cold audience out of it. Mm-hmm. And what Corey is saying there is the buzzword uh, search engine optimization, and the acronym is SEO, which we'll talk about with the course here in a second. Um, but the website, uh, to create a domain name, you can go through you know Google domains. I prefer namecheap.com with the Honey extension on my Chrome browser. I can usually get it for... Less than eight bucks oh, for man. the year, first year. Steal. I could um, buy a bag of beads for that much. Yeah. And then for hosting, you know, a lot of people use Square. Um, a different hosting platform is Squarespace. It's e-commerce based. So people would be able to pay you online. WordPress is a big one. Facebook is based off of WordPress, oh. WordPress platform. Um, Shopify. Yeah. Things like that. Weebly. Mm-hmm. Things like that. Those are your websites. Something we do not do is... Text message marketing, and it is there. It is the newest form of marketing, and it has an extremely high open rate. It does okay, but it, it's also a risky click because it could be very annoying to get a text from a guy you hired to remodel your kitchen seven years yeah. ago. I got a speaking of text message marketing. I got a cool camera bag. Okay. Okay, but how many camera bags do I need? A thousand. Apparently so, <laughs> according to this one company. Right. But I bought this cool camera bag. I actually loved it. And I did sign up. I think if I got, if I signed up for their SMS, I got ten percent off. Take my email, take my phone number. But he, they, this company sent a text message every single day. It's a rough one. That was a lot, and I blocked the number, right, which is absolutely fine. So they tested their campaign with you. It didn't work. Doesn't matter. They still got you to convert to make that initial purchase to get to their text message. I list. still accept their emails though. Right. So. 
So, and it's just kind of taste testing what works. Um, Paula's Choice, uh, if you guys are into skincare, <laughs> you've probably heard of Paula's Choice. If you opt into her text message campaign, you get 20% off. However, they send three texts a day. It's obnoxious. It's insane. But I did, and then I opted out, but I still keep the... Uh, the email. Yeah, I did want that 20%. So they got me to convert... Um, off of the 20%, which I'm sure their margin is so much higher. Mm-hmm. But anyways, um, now we're going to go old school addresses, an oh, address book, sending a mail or um, postcard mails. Uh, we have a client whose target demographic is in their 50s who love getting mail. Um, even though you wouldn't think a digital marketing agency would do uh, paper, we do do those mailers. Yeah, And they have... They're not wrong. When paired with the digital campaign, they it is are effective. very effective. So when we drop a mailer, we also drop a pin ad. Yes. Um, so they're seeing us not only in their mailbox, they're seeing us in their newsfeed. People are glossing over it. Pin ad. Yeah. <laughs> pin ad. Oh, uh, <laughs> a pin ad is a face a type of Facebook ad where I can drop a location identifier and say within the mile radius of this location, send these people an ad if they're on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And it's based off of people who actually live there, and you can have people who are driving through there as yeah. well if that's something you. So, want like to. an example, Heather's talking about a construction company we work with. Um, it'll, the ad will say, "Pardon our dust. We're just working in your community," and then. And they'll have a mailer that also goes out, hey, stay tuned for an update. We might have an open house to this. So they're getting hit twice. And plus they're seeing the trucks drive by that are branded. And hopefully everyone's doing good work. No one's speeding through <laughs> right. the community. Um, so if you see kind of what we've done at Sugar Cookie Marketing Group, you can see that we started this email. It's the 2 2 Tuesday thing. Mm-hmm. Um, if you wanted to sign up for that, you could go to our website where there's a landing page, sugarcookiemarketing.com. At the top, you can sign up for the newsletter. So now we've gotten you from Facebook to, well, you're on the podcast, sorry. <laughs> to, now we're telling you to head back to the website so you can get our emails. And but that's a diversification yeah. there. On the website, there's actually a Facebook pixel running that is collecting cookies from your account. So then I can reserve you another ad when you go yeah, back to Facebook. It's very co- confusing because we're talking cookies. But what Corey's saying is that when you click to our website, Facebook says, hey, this IP address who's logged into a Facebook account is looking at this website. Corey, if you want to run an ad directly to this person, you won't know who they are. But we do, and we'll show them your ad. And that's called uh, cookie-based marketing. It's called retargeting in Facebook. Yeah, my favorite. Um, yeah, it's a, you know, that's one that we use a lot because it's our warmest audience. You've already clicked to our website, so we don't have to warm you up from cold. You're yeah. warm. Now we got to make you hot. <laughs> it's a lot of baking. Um, you know, obviously, we have the Facebook page and the Facebook group. And at times, you'll see us post about the Facebook page. Um, and say, hey, guys, from the group, go head off to the page. What if the group shut down because I made another spider violence post again? Right. We'd lose 20,000 right. people. You know, Corey and I can only get two strikes against ourselves. And we each have admin. one. Yeah. <laughs> so, See you guys later. <laughs> yeah. So the way we circumvent that is is to diversify the marketing. Because if Facebook shut down today, would your business still be alive? Mm-hmm. If the answer is no, this above thing is something that you got to consider. That is very true. But also, um, we're constantly fighting the algorithm. Um, so being able to pull people from an algorithm-based platform like Facebook and to a podcast where it's chronological again. Mm-hmm. So every time this goes up, Spotify sends me a push notification. A push notification is really strong right under right. text. Yeah. Um, and to get people there, then I can show up in your inbox. You know, hopefully we don't go to promotions or spam and then kind of go through it that way. Right. And I think a lot of people sleep on email marketing. Imagine if having a pre-sale and someone did a live about this, selling out of your pre-sale just by using email marketing, then you don't even have to do the hassle of marketing, posting a mom's group because you're already sold out. Um, so if you're sleeping on that, just know someone else is not. <laughs> right. And he who has the most diversified marketing is he who sells most. It's as simple as that. You know, you can be really effective on a single platform and that is awesome. But if you lost access to that platform tomorrow, then you're starting from ground zero. And that's a rough one. That's a rough one. Um, So I'd say, you know, make sure, you know, we even have, this is an interesting thing. We created a sugar cooking marketing group registry where people can sign up with their email, um, say where they live, and you can refer them work. Mm -hmm. However, we did collect email addresses. Now, nobody opted into an email, so I can't email you directly without violating some kind of, you know, anti-spam laws. But what I can do is I can upload that email list to Facebook and send you an ad. And just another way of diversification. Right. (laughs) (laughs) You thought that that cookie collab. I may have been sick, but I was not (laughs) conniving. (laughs) So that is honestly, truly, probably maybe the most juiciest part of the podcast so far is diversification. I think a lot of people think it'll never happen to me. It will. 
It'll happen in Corey and I. If I woke up and the group was shut down tomorrow, I think Corey and I would go to lunch and have a lot to talk about. <laughs> but it would not surprise me. You own a majority of the stuff you don't own. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we can at least spread it out, that would be ideal. So just to recap what we kind of covered, uh, social media diversification would be a Facebook page, a Facebook group, an Instagram account, a LinkedIn business page, a Nextdoor business page, uh, Twitter if you just wanted to park it and post yeah. it um, and things like that in a TikTok account. Um, as far as audio, podcasting, again, more for our what Corey and I are doing versus like a cookie person. But if a cookie person wanted to start a podcast about their local area, now oh, then you'd have somebody who, you know, is diversifying what they offer their target audience yeah. on a different platform. Paid ads like Google ads, um, Google paper click, woof. Oh, that was a Oof. hard one. Google we'll paper click. We're, we'll we'll <laughs> allow it because she I'm, was <laughs> <laughs> Facebook ads and Instagram ads, retargeting ads, things like that. Next door sponsorships, if that was one. Email marketing. Uh, again, MailChimp, SendGrid, Constant Contact. There's like a billion, but I think right now I'm getting in bed with SendGrid. You just, I literally got in bed with them uh, this morning. <laughs> like them. <laughs> uh, websites, uh, obviously having your own domain name, uh, a landing page at least, but an e-commerce platform if you're cottage laws allow it uh sms texting if you want to try that gmb fall under the websites right google my business would be kind of a hybrid between a website and a social platform now okay all right um if you don't know what google my business is it is google's version of maps storefronts not storefront service it's very confusing that did not help me understand uh google my business i think we talked about it in a prior podcast i kind of walked everyone through it but um if you do go create one do not set your primary category as a bakery or you will have to have your address um shown what would you think we set it at set it for cooking classes it is not ideal but until google recognizes home-based bakeries it is our workaround your secondary category can be bakery and it will not show you your address thank you for clearing up about half the post this week (laughs) (laughs) sms texting uh it's another one i would use that sparingly i do think it is a highly effective way to reach your clients but i would definitely make sure they opted in and i would tell them it's only for when i'm about to do a porch pop-up i would say farmer's market build that one up like if you're getting a text from me it is because this is the real deal not that you're like hey work on a new recipe what you doing (laughs) um just like an email address you can burn your phone number as well if you're spamming people like a burner phone Mm, yeah so we use call fire which is voice over ip which is essentially i can send a text message blast to people um, monitor it through online it doesn't touch my Let's phone blast ever them out. okay <laughs> um, <laughs> and then collecting addresses old school yeah um and that's where you can drop you know a facebook pin ad or send a mailer or send an old school handwritten letter if i order cookies from you and i got a hey i would say Christmas. if you got a giant corporate order last year send them a little letter a little gift box just saying uh-huh. hey putting it out there and now this it sounds like a lot of work but i'd always recommend and Corey and i will be investing into and dissecting a few crm programs and that's customer relationship management programs it's where you enter in your clients information you know a database of their birthdays things like that and it will remind you when the last time you worked with them was what their order was and when their birthday is and how their you can kids them birthday in. imagine you getting the two-year-old luau theme yesterday and next year you say hey i know it's your daughter's third birthday coming up yeah, just, just imagine somebody out. remembering that yeah please remember my birthday remember and my an interesting thing if somebody always buys from you for mother's day uh to be able to follow up with them hey here's my mother's day pre-sales mm-hmm. that's a Absolutely. much easier way to sell somebody who's already interested i agree so that is the marketing minutes i talked a mile a minute but sultry and i feel like maybe sultry. my voice could be understood better a little bit probably can't but you seem sadder. Usually you're a little spicy. We have been fighting audio this whole time. <laughs> Corey's told that joke five times today. <laughs> no, I haven't nailed that. I'm ready to go. It is. I'm the nephew. <laughs> okay. I want to go to the business with baking. And I want to talk about reputation. Management. Management. Ding, ding. I'm not going to spend so much time today talking about Archon Mounts, but this definitely has to do a little bit with it. Um, But I do want to talk about a client, non-client, that we had a few years back who went international for all the wrong reasons. Right. So the reason why we were talking about this is, you know, some people in the group said, hey, if you worked for Archon, how would you have handled this? And Archon, pretty sticky situation. It's a rough one to handle, but all we can do is reference what we actually did with this um, pizza guy. Right. So let me give you some backstory. There was this local pizza shop, like just the tiniest little place, just down in Sterling, Virginia, a ways. And he got international news for all the wrong reasons. He made a burger for a lady. 
From what I understand, there was a tomato missing and a wilted lettuce piece. When he delivered it, the lady left a, was it a one-star review on Yelp? Or a three-star. Like three it originally a three-star three review on Yelp saying, no tomate, definitely a wilted lettuce. He reached back out and gotta said he was a going tomato, to. Man. You got to have a mater. <laughs> a mater. <laughs> a mater. So apparently he reached back out and said he was going to bring her a new order at the end of his shift. Little did we know, his shift didn't end until 10 p.m. that evening. Mm-hmm. So he shows up on this lady's doorstep. She says, banging on the door, demanding retribution. This is how the story spun it. So me and Heather had a free lunch one day. And I said, let us go take a little gamble. Let us. <laughs> let us. <laughs> Too soon. I so told, we went to this hole-in-the-wall pizza shop, kind um, of a mom-and-pop thing. Unfortunately, when we walked in, there was nobody in there. And I should have guessed that. So when me and Heather came in, there was this little tiny shy man behind the cash register. The guy looked like sadder than me today. You know? <laughs> like he had lived a life. Mm-hmm. So me and Heather sit down. And I just, you couldn't even, he almost thought we were the news people or someone that was going to give us a piece of the mind. But I did have my camera on me because i'm weird and i just went and i said dude what happened and this poor gentleman one he lied and he said somebody else but then later had to say okay when i said somebody else i lied it was me i just didn't want you guys to get mad at me so the story his side of the story said that he actually told the lady who was going to come on his off shift because he didn't have a delivery driver it was just him working so he said as soon as i get off i'll remake your your meal. Except for he didn't communicate that. He just did it and thought it would be like this great surprise and was like, hey, you know, and I threw in all this extra stuff, but he's banging on our door. She's like, what in the world? Mm-hmm. Well, me and Heather do about one charity like work a year. A year. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Heather, let us, since now we have both sides of the story, let's see what we can do to help this poor gentleman. Okay. First, the thing, first, what Heather did was took the keyboard from him. The problem was this went international. So a lot of people from like Europe, places like that were like, hey, I hate this place. Worst burger I've ever had. And this gentleman says, how could you come from France and here? You don't even deliver outside of a mile radius. <laughs> so we took his keyboard from him because he was defensive. The problem is they're entitled to their opinions and they're allowed to have them. And you being defensive just makes them even more grippy onto their opinions. So, yeah. If you're going to defend yourself, then I have to grip my armor even harder right. and defend myself. Right. Um, what he didn't do is he didn't validate feelings. And I think people confuse validation with agreement. Um, yeah. I can say, Corey, I, I, see, I see definitely why you feel that way. It makes total sense. The reason why this happened and then give my explanation without invalidating Corey, I can still give her my perspective, but I can agree with, hey, if I had those facts too, I'd feel the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So we ended up being able to respond to people in a much better, less defensive way. We made an apology and explained the story, but always accepting accountability. Hey, if it were on, you know, flipped shoes, of course, you'd be scared to open the door for somebody at 10 at night banging on your door with no, um, and people responded really well. Yeah. Then the next thing we did, Heather set up an email address to let people's voices be heard. Um, The thing was they were running to the nearest things, which were review sources like Facebook, Yelp, Google My Business and things like that. So what we did, instead of letting them have that as a place where they had a sounding board, we created an email address where they could they could literally type out whatever they wanted, and it would be forwarded right to the business owner. So he could see it, he could digest it, he could make a executive decision for how he'd move forward. And it allowed people to get off the public forums and go onto the private forums. So they were still being heard. It was allowing them to be able to almost be a balloon where they were just deflating, hey, getting their frustrations out, getting their opinions out um, in a safer environment for both them and for the business owner. Here's the unfortunate part. When you have mass amount of people running to a review website, that review website profile goes into a maintenance mode. And I don't think people realize that. I think they're like, hey, I'm teaching them a lesson. I'm ruining their Google My Business. You're not. Um, It'll go into a maintenance mode. And then it takes a couple weeks to a couple months. And all of a sudden, those reviews will start disappearing. Because technically, to leave an accurate review, you should have been at the store. Um, So people from Europe leaving a review for the pizza place they got, they ended up getting a large majority of them uh, removed. removed. Yeah, just because Yelp and uh, Google had kind of taken that one over. So that's absolutely fine. We still wanted them to have a place to talk and things like that. Then we did an apology, but the apology wasn't like this lady got it wrong. No, the lady was absolutely right. 
the way he handled the situation was incorrect. And what we were able to do for him was he was able to accept responsibility and to apologize and to say, I am learning from the situation. I am part of this community. Please stand behind me. I'm going to stand behind you. I'm doing things today to change. Yeah. And then we immediately dove into a bunch of charity work, which, you know, it sounds like, yeah, he was hurting. There was not any orders coming in. People were pretty upset, but he, I think we invited the police department. We did the whole fire department. The fire department and police department, right? I think those are two different days. Yeah. So we ended up doing two different days and I think he ended up donating something to a local church. Doing church and then teachers got a free yeah. lunch on Wednesday. So that was strategic giving. And then after he got some forgiveness from the local community, he extended an offer to a local Facebook group, the Northern Virginia Foodies, mm-hmm. um, where if you went and mentioned that you were with a group, you got like free garlic knots. So yeah. it was a, this is called reputation management and it is expensive. It's expensive to clean up and the internet never forgets. Uh, so to circumvent all that bad publicity, we had to really dig heavily into hitting his pockets. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, at cost pizza is pretty affordable. Um, police department loved it. Got to post the photos of the fire truck in front of the building. Right. Um, did really well. The great thing about that community driven giving back is that's his target audience. That's who's going to buy from him and that's who he needed to invest in. And when he started showing that, hey, he was a normal family man who made a mistake, the community really rallied behind him. And he, I mean, he's still in Because he today. went from defensible to oh, defensible? defensible. Offensive? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm kidding. He went from defensive to relatable. Yeah. And a defensive person, you know, everyone wants to take you down. A relatable person says, hey, we all make mistakes. I know. They're still in business, and me and Heather get free pizza for the rest of our lives. So. Right. I could not eat another pizza. <laughs> it was amazing. Though. My little belly was like, no, no. <laughs> the term, and I know I've said it on here before, the customer isn't always right, but they're never wrong. Right. And the ability to run to review website it's is, a, is scary. Um, so I'd say, you know, whether or not Archon, I wouldn't touch that situation with a 10 foot pole. But the concept being, if you, that's why our words are so important. They're so important. And it's amazing what I see some people in a Facebook group that's tied to their business profile are willing to write about each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I would always think twice before you press that enter button and say, I always ask myself, if this had to be read in a court of law, would I cringe? And then I backspace that email to that I write client and I write to them something (laughs) that if it had to go to court, would I be absolutely fine with what I wrote? Right. And I know I say it to Heather often. It takes so many dozens and dozens and dozens of cookies to build my reputation, but it only takes one dozen to tear it down. Yeah. Um, So when I see if there's an issue that arises, what does it mean to me to say, ha ha, I stuck it to all. Right. (laughs) No. You planted that, (laughs) aunt. Um, But how the pizza dude ended was Wendy Williams caught wind of it. And it turns out she found out the lady that had written the review had sold her story. She worked for a magazine and had kind of overplayed it. And then Wendy Williams oddly sided with the pizza company. Not like she had ever visited or anything like that, but it kind of turned the thing and it just died out of the... Right. So it was really weathering a storm. But had he kept that defensive nature up, I think it oh, would he'd have been a disaster. Yeah, he would have been out of business. There's right. no doubt about it. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to reputation management, uh, the best way to do reputation management is to not have to <laughs> do it. manage a reputation, um, but to get in front of problems and address them and validate the feelings of people. Uh-huh. Um, there are people who are unpleasable. There are people who are rotten, bad apples who will complain and they will tell you your cookies are broken and they weren't. Um, those are problematic people. And that's why we kind of have that pay to go away type thing. Right. But there are people who truly do have a concern and it would be best if you addressed it, validated them, and then came with the recourse that worked for both parties. I'm going to ask you a question, but I also want to tell people that yes, I will I- marry you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to tell people like I we ended up t- when he made the entire menu for the fire department and the police department. I had my camera there. So we took nice photos of his menu. So we were able to create marketing content Mm -hmm. for him moving forward, like professional looking photos. So he didn't seem like this like tiny business that opened yesterday that was going to steal your money and show up at your house at 10 p.m. And the cops loved it. They, They loved it. And so it was honestly a great marketing tool for him he still has the photos he still uses them i don't know yeah, to still... let um a police station taste test the menu i've never seen men so happy <laughs> yeah it was great but heather we do have this construction company that we had referenced before one yeah. day they did have a, an issue i think i've talked about this before i think we kind of did the math so about 10 years ago they had had a run-in with a client who was unpleasable 
okay, whether or not, whatever they should, the business owner said to the client, I no longer want to deal with you. And she took that as the green light to tear them down online. For 10 straight years. She has pulled, she has drugged their name through the mud. And if you hear, and I'm sure she has an accurate side of the story, if you're the business si- si- owner side, you would say like, oh, she was a truly unpleasable yeah, person. But she probably says... So they think that maybe she costs them around 10 to 11 projects, but their average project is $80,000 to $100,000. So imagine Imagine the cost of of that reputation. So what that company did initially was hide from it. Um, Oh, for how many years? Yeah. So she would create the profiles for the company and then leave the bad reviews. So she was, you know, creating a lot of profiles. Um, The way to get in front of bad reviews is more good reviews. And I know we talk about constantly get that good review because Mm -hmm. one day you're going to get that bad review because we can't please everybody. Yes. Um, Especially as your business growing, you're bringing on more clients and customers like that. There is just bound to happen a bad review coming out there. And sometimes they're even warranted. You know, sometimes things do go wrong. And as business owners, we're not perfect either, regardless of what we like to think. We're human. Right. And just to be able to get in front of that and manage it and let people feel validated and heard. And hey, thank you so much for that feedback. This is not what I want for my company. Let's talk about it. Let's work through this and find a resolution for you and for me. So Heather, how do we get good reviews? When someone says, oh my goodness, thank you so much for my cookies. They were amazing. They were a total hit at the party. That's when you ask for a review yeah, and send them a link. So, uh, you know, we always say that, um, people are, lazy. don't make them search, right? <laughs> people are I lazy. Am lazy. <laughs> um, so right now your Facebook review profile will be facebook.com forward slash your page name forward slash reviews. Mm-hmm. Um, that will be the direct hyperlink. I always include that in email. I don't want to tell them, Hey, you go to Facebook, you find me, you find the review tab, yeah. you leave it. It's not the less, uh, buried We're, entry there. Yeah. The better. So Corey and I always send a direct link to the review. Review. Good night. It's okay. It's okay. You're sick. I'm on a lot. I'm not even going to harp on it either. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just this week. A direct link to the review. Ah, the review profile. <laughs> Thank you, twin. Um, to get that review. Yeah, and if you want to, if you're like, oh, I, I keep getting so many reviews on Facebook, but I have none on Google, guess what link you're going to send? The Google one. You're mm-hmm, not going to mm-hmm, do the mm-hmm. Facebook one because you want to focus on having your eggs in different baskets. There you oh, go, do you see how I wrap that around? I see. So the lady that hates the construction company, even to this day, still runs them into the ground. And any post that someone says, do you have a recommendation for a construction company? She'll be like, I don't have a recommendation, but I have a non-recommendation <laughs> right. for this company. Yeah, and it's astounding. So the way that... Um, um, I don't want to say we make her look crazy, but the better reviews that company has, the more unfounded her opinion looks. Mm-hmm. Um, if you if she gave you that opinion, you looked them up and it was all one stars, you'd say, okay, then okay, there must yeah. be a huge problem right. here. So think in the way of what your clients are thinking and um, get in front of that inevitable bad review um, that you'll get. Because it's going to happen. It is. It is. So um, now we're talking about the course. When's our launch date? I'm scared of this. Boom, boom, boom. How many days are in August? It is in August 31st. Okay. You have one, yeah. two, three, four, four weeks. Crap you. Ooh. <laughs> oh, so much so, I know a lot of people like to ask about SEO, um, search engine optimization. Again, website optimization to rank well in search. And when we talk about search, we're mostly referring to Google, but we can't sleep on Bing. Hey, um, Bing I don't know comes, who uses Safari, but hey, yo. <laughs> Bing comes standard on Windows computers. And a lot of the older generation, <clears throat> generation with money, never switch over. <laughs> um, when you, you know, I'm a Windows user, but when I go to switch it to Chrome to be my default browser, the this message. Please don't leave us. It's like, are you sure? Listen, I can be better. Please. It's not you, it's me. I can change. <laughs> so uh, it's just to focus on the things that optimize a website. So you Let say, me well, just dumb it down even okay, for them. Please okay, them. Facebook, usually people who land on your Facebook page have been recommended by someone else. So they have to you have to know someone to end up there. With Google, you can actually just show up to people who don't even know you. So just imagine all the local people. We live in this DC area. It's very transient. A lot of people are moving in just as many are moving out. So if we can reach new folks that are coming to the area without having to have any extra marketing dollars or people screaming our names from the mm-hmm. mountaintops, just imagine how many more leads and conversions we can get. Right. Um, a part of SEO is Google My Business, which yeah. you'll see Gina Burke shouts from the mountaintops how it's transformed her business to have that profile. Guess where she learned that, guys? And the girl. Hey, and hey, the girl. So when we talk about search engine optimization, we're talking about a buzzword. It's called uh, user intent. Um, so if I'm looking up how to make icing, 
I'm probably not trying to buy from you cookies. I'm right. probably trying to make them by myself. But if I Google sugar cookies near me, that's buyer intent. Mm-hmm. So Heather did, we teach cookie classes. And during the height of COVID, when we were doing um, online classes, what are fun date ideas to do, do during COVID? And that's the blog post she wrote. That's where we try to rank it. And guess where we rank? <laughs> fun date ideas. And guess what's coming back around? <laughs> right. Come back, guys. Come back, class. Um, so yeah, user intent. So if you're thinking, well, what can I teach sugar cookie classes? What could I write? There, I gave him five ideas and I what do you think the third idea was? Bam. Cookie classes. Yes. Um, so things like that. And it's just c- putting yourself in the mindset of a um, client. If I, Corey, if I ask you to recommend a brewery to me, what would you Google? Breweries near me. There you go. And those are called <laughs> near me searches. And it's where a lot of people start their their um, knowledge search. Yeah. Um, and when you get those near me searches, you have a lot of power. If you are thoroughly confused, Heather will break it down in baby steps in the course. Break it down. Yeah. So anyways, the course is where we can truly be absolutely discussing with keywords and buzzwords and breaking down what it means when we talk about on page and off page and heather's going to be doing it physically in front of you so you're going to i'm going to screen share it yeah so maybe you know we're going to go through a couple boring charts pull up excel spreadsheets but hey that's how we learn yes all right voicemails kick it sister (laughs) (laughs) don't you want to give them the phone number (laughs) oh yeah you want to do it with your sultry voice five seven one five five six five six four four Okay, guys, you can call, you can text, you, you can, can email. email. You can smoke signal. Um, we don't answer any of them. <laughs> <laughs> if you send a bird, I'll be happy. Um, um, so we have a text from 7979 area code. Hi, twins. My name's Lindsay. I'm new here, and I'm trying to catch up on all the podcasts. So sorry if this is a repetitive question, which it's not. That's why we're answering it. I'm great at the creative side of business, but I struggle when it comes to actual business stuff and understanding it. I'm trying to understand all my costs better to make sure I'm charging enough to pay myself and make a profit. What would you all consider overhead in the cookie and baking world? Thanks so much for all you do in this community. Y'all are amazing. You're both my favorite twin. Mm-hmm. Okay, that is actually a great question and a fully loaded one. And we lost Heather in the research of it. <laughs> yeah, of course, like you ready? No, no, we're still talking about direct costs and the ratio between the two. So when we talk about direct costs, that's what you hear Corey and I talk about most of the time. Direct cost is the cost to produce the item directly. And that's going to be packaging, ingredients, ingredients and labor. Mm-hmm. Okay, now what you're asking is overhead, which are indirect costs. These are the things that you have to pay to keep your business going, but it doesn't directly relate to the product that you create. Okay. Um, an example is insurance. Um, with bakeries, uh, these home-based bakeries, FLIP insurance is what most people do, mm-hmm. and that's F-L-I-P. It's an acronym for something. Yes. Um, but a lot of people will add that as a supplementary insurance policy to their homeowner's And policy. it's not that expensive, uh, so definitely check it out with your insurance company, but it will save your buns. Right. I don't think a lot of insurance company will cover home-based businesses if you didn't tell them that um, when you made the policy. And I think even if you told them that, they say, we still don't cover it. So mm-hmm. get the supplemental insurance. Uh, shop supplies. Um, things you're buying Retailers. like <laughs> <laughs> uh, Taxes and licenses. Uh, utilities. Advertising. Charitable donations. Computer and internet. Office supplies. Telephone. Website hosting. Right. These are all indirect costs, but they go into running your business. And they're taking from your profit. profit. So determining your direct cost is really important. And then making a list of your indirect cost is as just as vitally important. So if we had an insurance policy paid out for the year and it was around $300, mm-hmm. you take 300 and divide it by 12. That would give us our monthly cost of insurance. Mm-hmm. So we need to get everything down to our monthly cost so we can start doing math with right. it, right? So let's say we do 16 dozen a week at 45 dozen, which is kind of low, but we want to time an average here. It's kind of a lot for me. <laughs> That's 720 a week times four weeks. We're looking at 2000 880 gross that means not that's not what we keep that's what we made okay now we got to take our cost out of it Mm -hmm. which you know is direct cost and our indirect cost um you'd want to determine how many dozens went out okay how many packages were in there how much did i pay for my packages packaging and um assess that and that's going to be a rate it's going to be a math problem dependent on where you bought your supplies how many you bought and what the cost was and things like that trying to store them all i have no storage left (laughs) right and it it, you know that's the problem with bulk buying the more space you have the more you can buy in bulk cheaper your cost and then you have the storage i need a storage unit Exactly. From and that's, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, so now you'd break down your indirect cost, you break down your direct cost, and then um, we take our gross and we start doing math with this. So if you take your indirect cost, again, website hosting, like yeah. that, insurance, and divide it by direct cost, your packaging, labor, and um, cost of ingredients, you'll get your overhead rate. 
And that's what she asked. So if that number is 20%, that means 20% of your revenue is spent on an overhead, mm-hmm. right? And um, the goal is to keep that always under 35%. That is a healthy business. If your costs are above 35%, something is wrong or you need to raise your prices. Raise your prices. Raise your prices. <laughs> Buy in bulk. <laughs> um, so keeping that, I think they recommend, uh, that was a Google search, 15% is a very, very healthy business. The lower your overhead rate, the more money is in your pocket. Mm, okay. That's a good thing to keep right. in mind. So, you know, I know this is like confusing because we're, I mean, so we're so far away to get our direct cost, uh, you know, figured out. And now we're throwing an in indirect cost. But if you want to know the true health of your business, it's understanding all of these numbers. I agree. Um, and, you know, Corey is actually, our sister works for uh, an app called YNAB. That's an acronym for You Need a Budget, Y-N-A-B. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is a great app to understand these numbers and to budget for them. And guess what? what? Uh, small Business Month for YNAB is, I think, September. And we are going to hopefully, fingers crossed, have a Facebook Live from the Business budgeting dude over there in our group so we're i will be quaking in my boots talks <laughs> that'll be great so anyways uh as far as overhead sounds like the healthy rate is keeping it below 35 percent between 15 and 20 percent is typical um the examples of what is considered overhead is yeah running utilities to turn your oven on it wasn't yeah. going to be turned on otherwise now you're baking cookies exactly. that's a cost i actually went and took a nap and the oven was still on the other day hey, can oh. i write that you can take it out of your profits. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Voicemail number two is a 719 area code. Hello, Twins Extraordinaire. She's talking about me. Huh? She's talking about me. Me too. Like most cookiers, I follow and engage with tons of other cookiers on IG. I was told this was bad behavior for a business account because these weirdos will never purchase cookies from me. True? Unfollow? What now? Thanks so much for all you do. Long live the beads. Gina from Beloved Crumb. That is a fantastic question, and I do think we had it one time earlier, but I want to address it again because it's so important. I like it. I will never say to unfollow cookie accounts. Some of my best friends are cookier folks, and guess who loves to comment and say, oh, my goodness, I love your technique that you did there? Other cookiers. Mm -hmm. Um, What I want to do is have a healthy mix of engaging cookiers to my local audience. Why? Because when someone engages like a cookier, guess where my post reaches more of? My local audience. So there is a strategy to have both there. Will they buy from you? Absolutely not. Can they help you beat the algorithm? Absolutely. And if anything, they almost understand it a little bit more because they're a small business owner like you and they know how much a comment, a like, a reaction, a share, and a save can do for you. The thing is, if they're doing it for you, you need to do it back for them. It's mm-hmm. kind of like the silent handshake on there. Um, I know if I go and comment on someone, I can always expect that they'll come back and comment on me. It's just the nice thing that bakers do between other bakers. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there's there's room for both there. So as long as you have a strategy to it, um, you can definitely mingle both of those. You I don't think have it's to. Corey, important there is behind your account, you have a strategy. Um, if your strategy is to get likes, a vanity metric, if that mm-hmm. is what you're, if you, an ego stroke is your goal, then you are going to be mostly engaging with cook gears because that's the goal is you yes. want likes, you want a big following, you want to be an influencer, whether you hate the word or not, that's what your goal would be. Right. Um, if your th- if your goal is, I want to make sales, then your strategy will become more local based if you can't ship mm-hmm. and things like that. So it's really just creating a strategy, creating a goal, and then lining it all up. And when those things come together, just like when the planets align, it, it makes beautiful marketing music. But when those things are disjointed and you're trying to make sales, but over here it feels like you want likes and comments, and over here it feels like maybe you send an email once a year, it's just... Right. Here's where I probably see the most differences. When cookiers post videos on um, like how to make icing, you are talking to bakers. So that's the ones who want to see that content. That's the ones who's going to respond to that content. Um, So you're telling people, hey, bakers, come and look at my stuff. You will love this content. You have made your account more to bakers. If you have more, like someone's doing Main Street cookies, she's going down our Main Street and recreating cookies of big items that people would know in her town. Right. She's making their logos and their signs into cookies. Right. So now she has made her strategy towards locals and cookiers can comment on it. Oh man, I love to see your post because they're so entertaining and like, oh, that's genius. Um, so she's has her strategy geared towards locals and cookiers can comment versus vice versa where locals be like, well, I don't really want to know how to make icing. I'm trying to buy it from you. <laughs> and you know, a great workaround and not against Instagram terms of service is Finstas, which are fake Instagrams 
it sounds weird, but it's just having more than one profile. So I have a personal profile that's kind of geared towards, I want to learn how to draw. Can't draw. Don't worry about it. No, nobody, <laughs> nobody can draw. Um, so I follow a bunch of Procreate accounts. But then I have my snake account, which don't worry, nobody likes that either. Um, I can post things about my snake and engage with people with snakes, and it's more snake-focused and things like that. Right. Okay. Right. Love that one. This last one is just a love letter. I just wanted to read it. Please read. Please read low and so 717 area code. Hi, Corey and Heather. My name is Sarah Wesley, and I just started my limited food establishment, Wesley Made Sweets, in Enola, Pennsylvania, near Harrisburg, in April this year. I've been doing cookies for many years, but finally took the fun steps to getting this show on the road. I just want to let you both know how thankful I am for the community you've created. I've learned so much from you, but the greatest thing about you, in my opinion, is how we can truly see that you both care. The way you speak and the comments you leave in the group means so much. I always tell my kids and my hubby that people helping where they can is really what makes the world go round and help you ladies are giving is huge. Um, I'm always laughing out loud listening to your podcast. Corey, you're not too loud. We're my laptop speaker. Awesome, awesome. And you guys are both super relatable. I legit cannot pick a favorite twin because you're both awesome. And I'm pretty sure you already know that. Keep being amazing. I really appreciate this Can comment. Can I get that as a tattoo? <laughs> yeah, that would be your entire body. <laughs> yeah, that was it was a book. <laughs> no, I really appreciate this comment. I know me and Heather treat the group like you guys are our family. And, you know, we find Greg Ericle. I said that for the person who asked Greg me. Greg Ericle. <laughs> um, to be funny, you know, it just sometimes me and Heather work a lot. We're always really working. You know, Corey, I go to bed at midnight or one. Corey wakes up at five. So it's about four hours you can get your heat sealer questions in there. <laughs> but we really enjoy this group and we treat you guys like family. Uh, we like to joke around with you guys. Literally some of our best laughs have been in the group. I don't know if that makes us sound like we have no lives at all. We don't. But... <laughs> so thank you so much for being in our lives. <laughs> uh, but we appreciate comments like this. And I know sometimes we joke around and um, folks are be like, I thought this was a marketing group. Um, at the core, it is a marketing group. There's always going to be marketing questions. You're always going to get my photography tips every week, but I enjoy laughing with you guys. I don't enjoy my face on Greg's, but <laughs> you, you win some miss, you have men in the group. Thank your lucky stars because someone, Becca, she took Corey's face and crossed it with Greg. Franklin, Greg, there's a podcast, Franklin, and um, and it was beautiful. And Greg Garrickle <laughs> lived a solid a couple of days in the group. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It does mean a lot. If you just want to call our text in and sing our if praises. If you just want to talk about how great we are, it would be wonderful. <laughs> that phone number is 571-556-5644. If you'd like to complain, that number is spam at gmail.com. <laughs> we never check it. <laughs> Heather, uh, it's sugarcookymarketing.com. I have those set to auto <laughs> All right. So now we are on to to group stuff. Heather, take it away. Okay, so I just want to cover some of the awesome past lives we had this last week. Everything you wanted to know about Farmer's Markets with Jody. Um, we did talk about this last week in the podcast, but it was really great. She had her dog in it, and loved I loved it. it. Uh, baking business efficiency and organization from calendars to prep with Gina Marie Burke. And she let that one be an AMA. Ask her anything she took everyone through. I liked it. How she even freezes the cookies, what she does with inventory and things like that. Um, and then on Saturday or Sunday, we had a Facebook Live from Money Hungry Monster to Cash Cow with Nicolette Lindsay. And she took us through the profit first mentality yeah. of business, which profit at first means that you are a profit first business that means costs are secondary and mm -hmm. it's a very interesting strategy and she wanted to lean in on the mental aspect of it so that was really neat i thought that was good now we have some upcoming events um Speaking of Greg Garrickle, <laughs> <Greg. Garicle. laughs> he is actually from Home Bakery to Brick and Mortar with Greg. There's a podcast, Franklin. This man has been there and done that. He has a brick and mortar store. He also has a food truck that he's getting up and running. And I think it's in its final stages. He's even shipping. And he doesn't even have a website to ship And his from. wife joined him uh, recently. a couple months ago. Right. So he's actually going to talk about all of that on Wednesday um, at 6.30 p.m. You can hear him large and in charge and we are excited to hear him support him and see his normal face on his face <laughs> right um after that we have optimizing square invoicing square appointments and square workflow with jessica wolf which is a huge thing that a lot of people ask <laughs> i think it's every other question in the group it's is about, something square. about square <laughs> and um you know she's a square appointments and a square workflow so if you so when i say square square dot com websites it's an e-commerce platform we're talking about websites this is a great one this is probably the majority of the people in the group i see use square yes um it has a payment processor processor, processor. that you can hook to your phone so you can take payments in person take them over the um internet and then you can have all these extra add-ons to kind of streamline your workflow. like sending you reminders of invoices yeah. things like that right. it is very very handy that which is keeps a very all tool. your kind of 
invoicing eggs in a basket, which I know. I know that just keeps a workflow very succinct. Yes. So no pain in the button. Then we have something I need to take, Color Theory with Catherine Gaines. And that's Monday, August 9th at 7.30 p.m. And the reason why I need it is because when someone says, I want pink, I look for electric pink. <laughs> that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's no chill. <laughs> Corey only sees bright color. <laughs> um, so that'll be an interesting one. And then wrapping it up is uh, Keto Chef Mike is doing an AMA, which stands for Ask Me Anything. Um, he's from Tall City Keto Bakery, and whatever question you have about keto, he is willing to answer. Yeah, so if someone's trying to break in that market, he's going to tell you how he did it. You can ask him, hey, what's your biggest seller? What's something you would never want to make again? How do you reach keto people? Yeah. And I'm sure that'll be interesting. Um, as far as group challenges, we just wrapped up the Then and Now collab. That was a fun collab. I just want to explain this collab to you guys. This was a collab where you remade your very first photo of your first bake. So well, what are collabs? Collabs are collaborations within a community where you all together choose a theme and post on the same day and then engage with each other's content. So like pat on the back, help you through the algorithms, um, bringing awareness. A lot of people do it for um, charities they want to do, awarenesses they want to bring. Um, we did a business theme. So a then and now to show the value to your customers of how you've grown over the time since you've been baking. So your very first photo of your first bake and you remade it. So I had a blast looking at people's befores and afters People are, are so insanely talented. I know, I know. I want we to had about two everyone out of the group. <laughs> out of the group. You, guys are, you have grown, outgrown us. <laughs> um, we had about 200 people sign up for that. So it was a lot of fun. We're working on an X collab. So I think it'll be fun and it'll be re, it will be making something in your town that's well known. So we get to live by DC. So we have like the Corey's making crop. like the easiest like obelisk <laughs> that we have here, the pencil, the Washington but Monument. Something like Main Street, if you have a sign that it's been there a million years and everyone knows, you know, take a left at that cornfield, you make the cornfield. <laughs> right. And that'll be a great way to one, show people in your town that mm -hmm. you made this really cool thing that they can all identify with. The more obscure, I feel like the better. Yeah, especially um, if you're like, got to guess where this is, where yeah, you think yeah, this yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, That'd be really um, But our marketing mindset with that one is you're, you're connecting with the locals. And it's a it's a great excuse to make something and to show, show it off to them and connect with them and say, hey, I'm here. I am right in your location. I want to bake for you. Look at this yeah. sign. That's really cool. Um, we're still doing the Instagram Reels and TikTok challenge. A lot of people have been seeing a lot of success. I know. Heather me, is making so me shower tomorrow so we can make yeah, the last really few. Enjoy. They're really corny, but I love making them. So uh, that'll end on the 15th. So we're only a couple weeks. Holy crap. <laughs> I should have yeah, make so many more. <laughs> we have Late Lunch Learn and Link Up with Sugar Cookie Marketing on August 26th at Seasons 52. Our tickets are sold out, but the happy hour is feel free to drop in. Then we have Cookie Con, Dallas and Orlando. Orlando, they had an update. There is a mask mandate now for anyone in attendance at Cookie Con Orlando, um, just because of the uptick in cases in Florida. As that morphs, if it changes at all, we'll absolutely let you know, but we're excited to see you guys and also be safe. I ordered a so. bunch of sugar cookie marketing merch for our mixer night. Also, we're partnering with Sam's Cookie University for the Mixer Night, and we'll be up against them. Sam and if and you Augusto. know us, nothing is serious. Everything's a joke. <laughs> I want them to lose. <laughs> they will lose. Um, and they're putting out a lot of cutters for that. Beads are involved. It's fun. I like it. I um, like we're also it. filming the podcast from there. I got to send uh, Karen the write up. Oh, please do. Yeah, we have yeah, to yeah. write it up. That means. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now we are on to interest. I did a live on this in the group. If you did not catch it, you can go watch it. But We Are Memory Makers is a company. That's not me and Corey. That's a company's name. <laughs> we Are Memory Makers. It is a company that sells through Michaels. You can also buy an online thing. But they made this thing called the Printmaker. And it prints. It's like a mini printer. So you can print it directly on boxes, ribbon, shoelaces, tags, anything like that. So it is not cheap. It was $200. Was not ready for that at checkout. And check then out. the accoutrement was an additional 75 Right. That's but some people don't know. We I did had a Facebook it. Live on it. I know. So definitely if you are like, what is she talking about? Go find it. But I ended up being able to make uh, – the crumbed cookies on a ribbon and tied it around my thank you cookie for my order this past week and the lady loved it. That's pretty neat. Is it worth it? Right now. I still need to play with it. Right. We did print directly on a box. We did on a mask. We did it on a piece of computer paper. We did on parchment paper. It didn't work. We did on Heather's arm. It did not work. No. It was just a big strip of ink. <laughs> right. But then I went and bought the wider. Oh, you did? Yeah, just to see. Did it? 
I have not yet. Try. Okay. okay. We'll do. We'll do. Okay. So. So I'm, you know, I like reading my books, listening to my books, but I started a book, almost done with it. It's called You Are Now Less Dumb. Um, and it is about the assumptions that our brain makes that it shouldn't. And it just to understand how your brain works and why it does what it does and to be a cognitively aware of it uh, and clothe cognition means that you're more likely to treat people better when they wear better clothes, even Ooh. regardless of their talents. They would not be treating me good right now. <laughs> you're not going to get the job at the job interview. But they're, you know, if a woman wears a suit jacket to a job interview, she's more likely to get hired, unfortunately. Right. But it's what our brains are conditioned to do. The Ben Franklin effect, have you heard that one? No. Um, if someone doesn't like you, ask them to do something for you. Their brain says, well, I definitely wouldn't do something for somebody I didn't like, so I must like them. These are good. Why don't you save this for the podcast next week, you old I'm thing? I'm so sorry. I don't know. De-individualization. De-individualization. Um, we kind of see that in the group with kind of a little bit of a mob mentality when people kind of gang up. It's when left to your own devices, you probably wouldn't, but enough people say something that you kind of join into it. And that's why you often see, you know, a I law think enforcement that's why, day. That's why the people in the cookie world said, don't charge over $25 a dozen. Right. And so then you're like, well, I may not agree with them, but I'm not going to say anything because the majority does. But yeah. it's not the majority. It's just the loudest. Yes. Um, things like that. And the sunk cost fallacy, one that I love, it's, let's say, we do it with books a lot. I've started this book. I've already listened to half of it. I don't enjoy the book, but I'm going to finish it anyways. No, sunk cost. Get rid of it. Um, oh, good. Because I get rid of every book I start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The same thing if you went to watch a movie. Halfway through the movie, you didn't like it. Would oh, you man. Leave? No, I usually am like, mm. sunk cost because you already spent the money on the ticket. But if you were truly valuing your time, you would leave because it's a sunk cost. You cannot get it back. You need to be able to walk away from it. But our brains cannot disassociate the time investment. They can't. They can't. Right. And then the book has about, I don't know, 30 of those, which is pretty interesting. Like you that. just kind of see how and why brains we do what work. we don't realize we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now we're on to sponsors. So, Eddie has had its price increase. <laughs> it <laughs> happened an eye two days ago. Um, but their cost rose, and so in turn, our cost rose. But they gave you a good month to make that decision. So now it ran up 5%, about 145 bucks, which is about the cartridge price. But it seems like Eddie folk in the Eddie group have just become insanely talented creative yeah i don't know why did we miss that boat what it was a to us? <laughs> piece of cheese with a logo on that's it that's a zucchini with a logo on it <laughs> so i think people are getting a lot more creative trying to push eddie outside of his Is, bounds which the eddie manufacturer said yeah we didn't realize you guys were going to do all this crazy stuff so they keep pushing out patches which are fixing a lot of right. the issues people see. so we me and heather printed i think last week or two weeks ago and it had a double print and then heather's like oh look there's an update a patch for cookies manually fed that have an oblong, <laughs> uneven shape over three and a half inches. This was the patch and it fixed the very <laughs> Heather issue. ruined five cookies before she updated the patch. <laughs> but if you want to see some creative ideas of people and their uses of Eddie, um, definitely join the Eddie group because people have been just fascinating with how they push it. I thought a very creative way that people were doing it was if someone had uh, like an invite, a birthday invite, they were using a portion of that invite that's and cute. printing it on the cookie. So everything really tied in to that event. I that thought that cute. was kind of neat. That was cute. Yeah, Eddie's pretty cool. Um, they'll be at CookieCon. Yeah, I saw his. Uh... Oh, they have some adorable pins. Yeah, they were so cute. <laughs> Best boyfriend you'll ever have. <laughs> and then our second sponsor is Bakety Bake. And that is BakeityBakeIdaho.com. And if you use the code CAPITAL, all caps, TWINS, at checkout, you save 10%. So I have made exclusively every order for the past two and a half weeks with Bakety Bakes meringue powder. How are, what are your thoughts? I'm obsessed. Really? We'll be ordering. Would you never go back to Ginny's or Gigi's or whatever? Because Ginny's, whatever the mom mentality up above <laughs> that you just talked about, everyone would just use it. So I just said, okay, I'll just use it. I never really questioned it. I did try some other brands. It was neither here nor there. I couldn't really see a difference. But I do enjoy the flexibility of this one. So it gives me some time to work with the icing before it starts crusting over, huh. which is probably Might my hardest part. Classes. Absolutely. So we'll be using that. Oh, so okay. I need to make an order. So I'm almost out. Okay. Well, bakety bake, Idaho. Use code twins at checkout. You save 10%. <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> okay. The mailbag. Uh, there is mail. I forgot to check it. However, we got um, from Meredith from the Bake Along. Uh, Meredy sent us two shirts. Can't, they're super good. I cannot wait. And I'm going to wear it next week when I, next week I took no orders. You know why? No. Because I am completely dedicated to mastering macarons. 
So I'm oh, only going to bake those instead of spending cute. endless time baking. Come on, them. highlighter pink. <laughs> <laughs> Go and grab it. <laughs> okay, I think that wraps us up for this week. Sorry for my downtrodden demeanor. I am getting better. But tune in next week because I'm going to talk about my back to school pre-sales and how I sold out of you them. You did. It's pretty slick. I've been, I've been watching you all weekend. Heather's like, an admin on my page so she can the see The funny thing is, and just before we close out, Corey's writing special things that you can request some writing. So I get copied on her business page messages and I said, Corey, why are these people being so uplifting? Like, I love you. You're, you've got <laughs> Keep it this. up. <laughs> I was like, oh no, they just want me to write it on a cookie. <laughs> I was like, man, just people are just, just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks for tuning in.